Make them mind your weather, sister. And them weather your mind. Now that's how you supposed to drive! Talk about raising the stakes. The title of this episode should have been called Consequences, because that is definitely the thing. The episode also answers a few questions. The first being, what did Professor Xavier think would happen if he left and put Magneto in charge? Xavier wakes up in what's left of the mansion. With the power out worldwide, he's forced to use a regular wheelchair. The metal beam spewing his hover chair is a perfect metaphor for what remains of his dream. But the big moment happens when Cyclops confronts Xavier about leaving, asking the obvious question. Why did Xavier put Magneto in charge? His answer, so Scott could enjoy his life. Oh, don't worry, it's dumber than it sounds. Xavier knew that Cyclops would stay with the X-Men no matter what, that he helped create a world where mutants could be equal, but he never let himself enjoy it. So Xavier put Magneto in charge to free Cyclops from his loyalty to the team. Yeah, that's a really dumb idea. For one, it begs on Magneto going along with Xavier's dream, which was never going to work because of all the baggage Magneto carries. Humans would eventually do something that would go too far, and Magneto would try to get revenge. That said, Xavier has been shown in both the show and comics to have a blind spot for how far Magneto will go when pushed. Two, Xavier knows that Scott is loyal to him and the cause, so the idea that Magneto, the team's greatest enemy, joining and leading the team would make Scott feel free to leave obviously wouldn't work. He might leave for a while, but the idea of Magneto being in charge would eventually bring Cyclops back. This is just a bad decision on Xavier's part, and he pays the price for it. When he holds out his hand for Cyclops to join him, Cyclops walks right on by. Later on, everyone regroups in what's left of Xavier's office. He takes full responsibility for what happened, but again suggests another stupid plan. Try to reason with Magneto. The man set off an electromagnetic pulse across the world that's disrupted all the electronic devices on the planet and is destroying the Earth's magnetic field. If the planet loses the field, there goes the planet's defense against the sun's radiation. The X-Men only have 12 hours to fix this or all life on the planet will end. That's something Magneto knew. That's why he did it. So, reasoning with him is not an option. Sure, this does sound like something Xavier would say, so there's at least that, but the plan is just dumb. However, we do get some new info in the scene. We get an answer to the other question lingering from the previous episode. How many people did Magneto kill with his EMP attack? It appears to be thousands. It's not clear exactly how many thousands, but we are told that more people died in Genosha than from Magneto's attack. In both cases, the death toll could be in the tens to hundreds of thousands. This was a huge bugaboo for the Trask, Byrick, Executioner, and Bastion supporters. It's been interesting watching how these people engage with the show. They had nothing to say about the attack on Genosha. No comment about the death toll. No comment about the symbolism of the attack. No comment about the politics of the people who remained silent or those who thought it was the right thing to do. But the moment Magneto retaliated, well then those people just came to life. And they had so much to say about how Magneto's actions justify fearing, hating, and killing mutants, and how this proves the evilness of the people who support the X-Men and mutants. They completely missed that Magneto had the power to do this this whole time, but never did. He didn't do it randomly either. It was in direct response to all the member states of the UN signing off on an attempt to kill all mutants, first in Genosha, and then the rest of the world. That doesn't justify Magneto condemning the entire planet, which includes mutants, to an irradiated death. It does, however, make his actions understandable. This is the second time in his life that a group tried to wipe out his people while the rest of the world watched and did nothing. This is the second time that a group has been damn near successful at it. This was a man looking for a reason, and the world gave him one. The other thing is that people forget Magneto is a villain, and villains do bad things. So what did they think would happen? Did they think the guy who held UN officials thousands of feet in the air and warned them not to make him let them down was bluffing? He's not bluffing. He meant what he said. This is the cost of mistreating people. 
consequences. Eventually, some of those people will get power and decide to do to you what you did to them. This is the most basic lesson every animal on this planet learns, but for some reason, this lesson goes over the heads of people from a certain political and religious persuasion. They seem to think it's okay for them to abuse other people, and believe that none of those people will ever want or try to get them back. But should it happen, it's never justified or even understandable, and only proves that they were right to fear and hate those people and want to wipe them out. The thing is, you can't have it both ways. You can't be cruel to others and then expect that your cruelty won't cause some of those people to become as cruel as you. Humans can't slaughter mutants and then expect that some of those mutants, like Magneto, won't return the favor. That doesn't mean Magneto was right to do what he did. He not only condemned humans, but his fellow mutants and all life on the planet. It also doesn't mean that Magneto isn't being hypocritical. He says that he opposes tyrants and bigots, but he has become the very thing he hates. What it does mean is that it's understandable how he got to that place. He's watched his people be targeted for annihilation twice. He was betrayed and attacked by one of those groups immediately after they suffered an attempted genocide. He's watched all efforts to reason with humans fail. He's watched his oldest friend try the most peaceful solutions only for his students, then still children, to be attacked and nearly killed for trying to help. He's seen every way asking for tolerance can go wrong and that has jaded him. It's understandable Magneto would take an extreme action. It's also funny that the people who hate the show constantly scream about the lack of subtlety and nuance in modern media, but when it's presented to them, they ignore it and never bother to follow the plot and story to see why things happen in context. No, they've got a narrative, and they're sticking to it. Good storytelling be damned. Anyway, we also get another piece of information in the scene. Xavier tried to recruit Bastion when he was a kid, but Bastion's mother shut the door on him when he said the word mutant. As Storm says, if things had played out different, Bastion would have been on the original X-Men team. The idea that Bastion is effectively persecuting people like himself makes him an interesting villain. We see at the start of the episode him crying as he carries his mother's body. That suggests that he cared for her, even though he turned her into a prime sentinel, stripping away her autonomy. There's some complexity to Bastion. I don't know how much that will be explored since there's only one episode left in the season, but there is another storyline there to tell. We also find out that Bastion is the source of the control of the Sentinels. Beast and Forge plan to retrofit one of the power dampening collars to inhibit Bastion's ability to control technology. Forge's mechanical leg still works because he created EMP shielding for it years ago, so he and Beast plan to use that to get around the EMP blackout. However, they also mention that Muir Island has Shi'ar technology, which is resistant to EMP attacks, so it's not clear why they don't just use that technology. At any rate, the pair float the idea of using the neutralizer tech to permanently shut off Bastion's powers, but Storm isn't having it. The plan is to split the X-Men into two teams. One will go after Bastion, while the other deals with Magneto. Speaking of Magneto, he decides to resurrect his old dream and raises the remains of Asteroid M from the ocean. As night falls, Xavier goes to talk to Rogue, who's now wearing Gambit's coat, and she just lays into Xavier, saying that if he had thought of them as people instead of students, maybe Gambit would still be alive. To be fair, the situation is kind of Xavier's fault, but not entirely his fault. But he's pulling a straight Picard move here where he just lets people trash him. The tongue lashing doesn't last long, because Magneto shows up with Asteroid M. Xavier tries to talk him down, tries to reason with him, but Magneto has a perfect response. I promised a boy a future free of fear, only to watch his frightened eyes be vaporized inside his tiny skull, because he believed in me, in the dream you had me sell. So he's not changing his mind. He's also not there to fight. He's there to make an offer. Any mutant who wants to is free to join him on Asteroid M, and to everyone's surprise, Rogue takes him up on the offer. When the others are like, why, Rogue explains. You were gone, gal. None of you were there the day Genosha fell. Who dies next, Professor? Jean? <laughs> Been there, done that. Who knows where Bishop is? And hell, Morph was barely on the team 30 minutes before we tossed them to the wolves. That Morph comment was uncalled for. That's really petty. True, but petty. Then Roberto joins Magneto because his mother gave him up to the Sentinels. Like I said before, consequences. I saw people flipping out about Rogue turning, but this did happen in the comics. The difference is that it was Colossus who switched sides, not Rogue. Colossus defected after the death of his sister Ilyana to the Legacy Virus. 
Some people took issue with Rogue switching, forgetting that in previous episodes, Rogue had questioned her powers, her role with the X-Men, and Xavier's ideals. It wouldn't be a stretch for her to switch sides, and in the broader case, a storyline about an X-Men defecting is an important story to tell. It doesn't matter who does it, so much as someone does it. The X-Men are supposed to be grounded in reality, and in the real world, people become disillusioned with causes, especially after traumatic events. It makes sense that someone from the team would switch sides after Genosha. Since Colossus isn't on the team, the next best person would be Rogue. She's got the best reason to do it, and it fits her personality. Storytellers shouldn't avoid having characters make difficult decisions that the audience might not like. These are the things that make storytelling interesting, makes the stories feel real. However, some things should be avoided, like putting wigs on characters' costumes. After Magneto leaves, the X-Men go to Muir Island and suit up, but the suits all have hair on them. Storm's suit even has her skin tone. I think this was just a mistake, that whoever drew these forgot that these were suits and not the characters, but it's still funny that they made it into the show without anyone catching it. While the X-Men prepare, Xavier has a chat with President Kelly. Xavier again argues for reason, both from Kelly and for Magneto, which makes the situation all the more ridiculous. Xavier already saw that Magneto made up his mind, so there's no point in arguing for talking him down. Worse, President Kelly appears to have been in on the attack on Genosha. He appears to have backed Bastion. He set up the Magneto Protocols, which are a series of satellites designed to shift Earth's magnetic field so that Magneto can't use his powers on the planet anymore. Given all that, why in the world should Xavier try to reason with Kelly? According to Xavier, the world will now end in an hour after their meeting. He doesn't have time to argue with President Backstabber. But all that kind of falls to the wayside because the last 10 minutes of this episode are pure epicness. The animation here is glorious. I had a feeling that was going to happen because the animation in the rest of the episode was a little weak. I figured they were saving their time and money, and I wasn't wrong. We start with Storm just wrecking Sentinels with this massive tornado. Then we move to Gene vs. Sinister, with Gene literally catching this dude monologuing and just whooping his ass. She beats him so bad he activates the sleeper code in Cable and six Cable on her just to get a breather. Gene and Cable are both powerful telekinetics, so they're damn near evenly matched. While that goes down, the rest of the X-Men show up on Asteroid M and fight their former teammates. Xavier tries to talk Magneto down again, and we get this beautiful moment. Oh, how I've waited to say these two words to you, old friend. Shut up. I have to admit, I'm not bothered by this. He should have done it sooner. At any rate, back on Earth, Bastion gets the upper hand. Mork tries to trick him by changing into Sinister and telling him to flee because the X-Men are coming, but Bastion sees through it because Sinister would never help anyone else. Beast tries to put a collar on Bastion, but gets caught. The Sentinels take down Storm and Forge, and Cable starts to overwhelm Jean, so she contacts Cyclops. In the middle of that, Wolverine manages to get Magneto's helmet off so Xavier can take over his mind, but Cyclops blasts Xavier since Jean and the others still need time. Magneto decides to finally deal with his old friend. He puts his helmet on Xavier, blocking Xavier's powers, and then slowly begins to crush Xavier's skull. He doesn't get to do it too long, because Wolverine stabs Magneto in the back and we get a friendly reminder that this is not Fox Kids, so they can show blood. Wolverine is willing to do what nobody else would do, something he's been itching to do for a while. But remember the theme of this episode, consequences. It might not be a good idea to attack a guy who can control metal if your entire body is laced with metal. He might feel the need to get closer, and that might lead to one fatal attraction. It's literally right out of the comic. The only difference is that the direction of the scene is flipped and Wolverine screams. In the comic, it happens so fast he doesn't even have time to make a sound. Just tears the adamantium out of his body. That last frame is a perfect ending to that episode. This was another banger. A little bit of a slow burn at the beginning, but the ending was worth it. Now, I have no idea where they're going for the last episode. They've already combined so many different storylines and done it out of order that there's so much that they can still pull from. I suspect that the next season might involve an adaptation of the Onslaught Saga. That would be the natural aftermath of Xavier meddling with Magneto's mind, which is what happened in the comics. We still haven't seen Bishop again, so maybe he might pop back in for the save. Honestly, I don't know, but so far these last few episodes have been so good that it's hard to believe the show would drop the ball in the last episode. It's not impossible, but very unlikely. 
So I'm excited to see how this ends, because damn, this has been one hell of a ride. But what do I know? I'm just some guy.